The Sicilian Mafia, also known as Cosa Nostra, originated in Sicily in the mid-19th century. It operates as a criminal society, comprising gangs that offer protection and arbitration services under a shared brand. The Mafia's primary activities include protection racketeering, resolving disputes among criminals, and overseeing illegal agreements and transactions. Organized into families or clans, each claiming sovereignty over a specific territory, they operate in towns, villages, or neighborhoods within larger cities. Members identify themselves as men of honor, although the public often calls them mafiosi. Over time, widespread emigration from Sicily led to the establishment of mafia-style gangs in various countries, including Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, the United States, and South America, preserving the traditions and methods of their Sicilian origins to varying extents. History. The origin of Cosa Nostra is challenging to trace due to the secretive nature of mafiosi, who often spread deliberate lies about their history. The Mafia's roots can be traced to 19th century Sicily during its transition from feudalism to capitalism and unification with mainland Italy. Feudalism's decline led to an increase in landowners and commerce, resulting in more disputes and the need for extra-legal arbitrators and protectors. As the state took over enforcing the law, clashes between official law and local customs persisted, leading to unreliable law enforcement. The rise in crime, coupled with the lack of manpower, prompted property owners and merchants to turn to extra-legal protectors, eventually forming the first Mafia clans. In response to banditry, local elites formed companies at arms comprised of former bandits, evolving into what scholars identify as proto-Mafia. The Mafia primarily emerged in western Sicily, where smaller estates made it cost-effective to contract protection to Mafiosi. Early Mafia activities were closely tied to citrus growers and cattle ranchers, industries vulnerable to theft and vandalism. The Mafia's involvement was more effective than the police in recovering stolen cattle. Mafiosi began meddling in politics, exerting considerable influence with their control over a significant portion of the electorate. Reports in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by police officials like Ermano San Giorgi detailed mafia initiation rituals, codes of conduct, and criminal activities. Mafiosi were involved in counterfeiting, kidnappings, murder, robbery, and witness intimidation. Attempts to annihilate the mafia through arrests and trials were often unsuccessful, reinforcing their influence. Studies suggest the emergence of the Sicilian Mafia can be linked to the resource curse, specifically sulfur-rich areas vulnerable to Mafia-type organizations due to a weak state and lootable natural resources. Additionally, the surging demand for citrus fruits, driven by their curative properties against scurvy, played a role in the Mafia's development. The rise of socialist peasant fasci organizations further fueled Mafia activity as landowners and politicians turned to the Mafia to resist peasant demands in an environment with weak state presence. Fascist Suppression In 1925, Benito Mussolini launched a campaign to eradicate the Mafia in Sicily and consolidate fascist control. The Mafia's threat to his power and its links to Sicilian politicians motivated Mussolini's efforts. A key incident occurred in Piana dei Greci, where Mussolini's rejection of Mafia protection led to humiliation and fueled his resolve. Mussolini appointed Cesare Mori as Prefect of Palermo in 1925, granting him special powers to combat the Mafia. Mori's aggressive tactics, including hostage-taking and property seizures, resulted in over 11,000 arrests by 1928. Despite some confessions being extracted through coercion, the campaign significantly weakened the Mafia. Mussolini recalled Mori in June 1929, marking the end of the campaign. While the Mafia wasn't permanently crushed, the suppression was effective, leading to a decline in Sicily's murder rate. Landowners benefited by raising legal rents dramatically. 
During World War II, Allied forces invaded Sicily in 1943, causing upheaval and chaos that contributed to a rise in crime. The Mafia, having survived Mori's campaign, resurged during the Allied occupation. Former fascist mayors were replaced with mafiosi, who presented themselves as political dissidents with anti-communist positions. The Mafia adapted to the changing economic landscape, shifting its power from rural to urban areas. Post-war reforms in Sicily aimed to empower peasants, leading to conflicts between the Mafia and socialist reformers. A notable incident, the Portella della Ginestra massacre in 1947, underscored Mafia resistance to agrarian reforms. While the Mafia opposed these changes, it eventually benefited by purchasing land from landowners who chose to sell to mafiosi instead of adhering to government reforms. In the 1950s, the United States crackdown on drug trafficking led to the imprisonment of American mafiosi. Seeking to establish a foothold in the lucrative American drug market, American Mafia boss Joseph Bonanno negotiated the creation of a Sicilian Mafia Commission in 1957 to mediate potential conflicts among Sicilian clans. Sack of Palermo In the post-war era, Palermo experienced a significant construction boom due to Allied bombing during World War II leaving over 14,000 people homeless and prompting rural migrants to move to the city. The demand for housing led to extensive building projects, often subsidized by public funds. However, the period also saw the infiltration of mafia influence in construction and related industries. In 1956, Vito Cianciamino and Salvatore Lima, mafia-affiliated officials, assumed control of Palermo's Office of Public Works. Between 1959 and 1963, a small group, likely acting as mafia fronts, secured around 80% of building permits. Construction companies not linked to the mafia were coerced into paying protection money. Many structures were erected illegally before city planning was finalized, leading to the destruction of historic buildings and the construction of substandard apartment blocks. The Mafia's control extended to various sectors, including quarries, site clearance firms, cement plants and wholesalers for construction materials. During the 1950s, the Mafia expanded its influence in the construction and cement industries, drawn by the high local economic involvement and the legitimate facade provided by the cement business for their illicit activities. First Mafia War the First Mafia War marked the initial major conflict between Mafia factions in post-war Italy, showcasing the enduring tradition of violent rivalries within the Sicilian Mafia. In 1962, a dispute over a drug shipment to the United States led to a deadly confrontation. Mafia boss Cesare Manzella collaborated with the Grecos and La Barbera's clans, but a disagreement arose over missing heroin. The La Barberas accused Calcedonio di Pisa, in charge of the heroin, of embezzlement. The Sicilian Mafia Commission sided with di Pisa, leading to the La Barberas murdering di Pisa and Manzella. The conflict claimed numerous non-Mafia lives, with incidents like a Palermo shootout and an assassination attempt on Angelo La Barbera in Milan. In June 1963, a car bomb in Chiaculli killed six military officers and a policeman, sparking national outrage and a crackdown. Nearly 2,000 arrests were made and the Sicilian Mafia Commission dissolved. Mafia activity declined as clans disbanded and members went into hiding. The commission reformed in 1969 and trials in 1968 resulted in many acquittals or light sentences. Financial losses and legal troubles left most mafiosi impoverished. In Palermo, mafia families ceased activity for years until the conclusion of trials in 1968 allowed them to regroup. Smuggling boom. The 1950s and 1960s posed challenges for the mafia, 
But the 1970s saw a significant increase in their illicit activities, notably in smuggling, with cigarette trafficking emerging as the most profitable racket. In the 1970s, Sicilian and Neapolitan crime leaders collaborated to establish a lucrative monopoly on cigarette smuggling to Naples. Following the shutdown of heroin refineries in Marseille run by Corsican gangsters, Sicily became a focal point for morphine traffickers. From 1975, Cosa Nostra initiated heroin refineries across the island, aiming to control both the refining and distribution of heroin. Sicilian mafiosi expanded to the United States to personally oversee distribution networks, often superseding their U.S. counterparts. This led to a surge in heroin addiction in North America from the mid-1970s to the early 1980s. By 1982, the Sicilian Mafia dominated approximately 80% of the heroin trade in the northeastern United States. The distribution network often utilized Mafia-owned pizzerias, disguising revenues as restaurant profits, known as the Pizza Connection. Second Mafia War In the early 1970s, Luciano Leggio, a member of the Sicilian Mafia Commission, orchestrated the formation of the Corleonese Coalition, aiming to dominate Cosa Nostra and its narcotics trade. After Leggio's imprisonment in 1974, his deputy Salvatore Riina assumed control. The Corleonese employed bribery, subversion, and secret recruitment to expand their influence, leading to the expulsion of Gaetano Badalamenti from the commission in 1977. The Second Mafia War erupted in 1981 with the murder of rival commission member Stefano Bontade, resulting in widespread violence and the Corleonese's ultimate dominance. Riina, now the de facto boss of bosses, manipulated Mafia rules, replacing clan bosses with hand-picked regents. Simultaneously, the Corleonese launched a murderous campaign against journalists, officials and policemen who opposed them. Frustrated by the lack of cooperation, police clashed with politicians at a 1985 funeral, reflecting the tense relationship. Suspicions of Mafia ties surrounded Prime Minister Giulio Andreotti, High Court Judge Corrado Carnaval, and Sicilian politician Salvatore Lima. In 1999, the Italian court acknowledged Andreotti's deliberate association with the Mafia, contributing to its strength, but the statute of limitations prevented his conviction. Maxi trial. In the early 1980s, magistrates Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino initiated a bold campaign against Cosa Nostra. A crucial breakthrough occurred with the arrest of Tommaso Buscetta, a mafioso turned informant seeking protection from the Corleonese, who had targeted his associates. Inspired by Buscetta, more mafiosi cooperated with Falcone and Borsellino. They orchestrated the Maxi Trial, conducted from February 1986 to December 1987 in a specially constructed bunker courthouse. The trial saw 475 mafiosi prosecuted, resulting in three 38 convictions. In January 1992, Italy's Supreme Court of Cassation upheld these convictions. Widely regarded as the most significant trial against the Sicilian Mafia, it stands as the largest trial in world history, war against the state and Riina's downfall. The Mafia responded with extreme violence, assassinating a judge, his son, a prosecutor, and an anti-Mafia businessman in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Political ally Salvatore Lima was also killed for failing to overturn convictions as promised. The infamous bombings that killed magistrates Giovanni Falcone and Paolo Borsellino in 1992 triggered public outrage and a robust government crackdown. Salvatore Riina, Mafia boss, was arrested in January 1993, leading to more informants coming forward, albeit at a high personal cost through the murder of their relatives. 
Post-Riena, terror attacks aimed at discouraging collaboration continued, targeting tourist spots and causing significant casualties. The Mafia's choice to attack cultural and church landmarks aimed to destabilize the government and express dissatisfaction with the Catholic Church's perceived change in its policy towards organized crime. After Riena's arrest, leadership briefly passed to Leo Luca Bagarella, then to Bernardo Provenzano in 1995, who transitioned from violence to a period of quietude known as Pax Mafiosa, Provenzano years. Under Bernardo Provenzano's leadership, Cosa Nostra implemented several changes in its strategy. The murders of state officials were halted, and the policy of killing informants and their families was replaced with efforts to convince them to retract their testimonies and rejoin the Mafia. Additionally, Provenzano restored the Common Support Fund for imprisoned mafiosi. By the late 1990s, Cosa Nostra had weakened significantly and had to cede control of much of the illegal drug trade to the Ndrangheta crime organization from Calabria. In 2006, it was estimated that the Ndrangheta controlled 80% of the cocaine imported to Europe. The number of defectors from Cosa Nostra decreased as the Mafia began to favor initiating relatives of existing mafiosi, believing them to be less likely to defect. Bernardo Provenzano was arrested in 2006 after 43 years on the run. His successor as the boss was Matteo Messina Denaro, who remained at large until his arrest in 2023 Modern Mafia in Italy. The Article 41 Bia's prison regime imposes strict controls on the contact of incarcerated Mafia bosses with the outside world, limiting their ability to run criminal operations from behind bars. Antonino Giuffre, a close confidant of Bernardo Provenzano, who that included repealing the regime and other anti-mafia laws in exchange for electoral support in Sicily during the formation of Forza Italia, Berlusconi's political party. However, these allegations have not been confirmed. Despite Giuffre's claims, the Italian parliament reinforced the provisions of Article 41b's and it was made a permanent fixture in the penal code, extended to cover other crimes such as terrorism. Although the 41 BI's regime has been criticized for its strict measures, including by human rights groups like Amnesty International, it continues to be enforced. Some mafiosi have been released on an individual basis, raising concerns about the potential impact of the regime on prisoners' human rights. The Mafia's involvement in criminal activities continues to evolve, adapting to new opportunities and challenges. In 2015, the Mafia Capitale investigation revealed that the Mafia was profiting from the European migrant crisis and exploiting refugees. The investigation shed light on the organized crime's ability to adapt to and exploit various situations, including humanitarian crises. In subsequent events in October 2017, members of the Renz Vio crime family, along with two Carabinieri military police officers, were arrested for their involvement in the drug trade and large-scale extortion. This operation resulted in the arrest of 37 individuals and over 600 officers were deployed. The Renz Vilo Mafia family was suspected of forming alliances with other criminal organizations, such as the Ndrangheta and Camorra. The investigation revealed their activities in Germany, suggesting an international reach. Another significant operation occurred on January 22, 2018, when Carabinieri police arrested 58 people connected to 16 Mafia families in various Sicilian cities. The charges ranged from Mafia association and drug trafficking to extortion, fraud and vote buying. The mayor of San Biagio Platani, Santino Sabella, was among those arrested, accused of colluding with the Sicilian Mafia to influence candidates in the 2014 local elections and manipulating the allocation of council contracts. Additionally, protection rackets targeted businesses, including companies running migrant reception centers in Sicily. These events underscore the enduring and adaptive nature of organized crime groups like the Mafia, 
demonstrating their involvement in a wide range of illicit activities and their ability to infiltrate various sectors of society. The Game Over operation in February 2018 targeted a crime family based in Palermo, resulting in the arrest of 31 individuals with ties to the organization. The charges included money laundering, fraud, and drug trafficking. Benedetto Bacchi, a key figure reportedly controlling over 700 betting shops across Italy and earning about 1 million euros per month, was among those arrested. Bacchi used an online gambling operator licensed in Malta, and his license was suspended as a result of the investigation. Investigators revealed that Bacchi had acquired a construction company and a villa formerly owned by footballer Giovanni Tedesco for 500,000 euros. The villa was listed for sale at 1.3 million euros shortly after the purchase. The investigation also suggested that Baki considered taking over a news publication with criminal proceeds. Additionally, there were allegations of collaboration between the American Mafia in New York and the Sicilian Mafia, involving the establishment of a profitable food export company. Palermo, traditionally a stronghold of Cosa Nostra, witnessed ongoing criminal activities, with the arrest of an alleged new Mafia boss in July 2019. Reports highlighted the notorious mafia activity in the Sicilian town of Paso di Rigano, where they were involved in various businesses, including wholesale food supplies, online betting, and gambling. Links between Cosa Nostra and New York's Gambino crime family were also confirmed, emphasizing the global reach and connections of these criminal organizations, structure and composition. Cosa Nostra operates as a decentralized entity comprising approximately 100 groups commonly referred to as families, cosce, borgatas, or clans. Contrary to the familial implication of their names, members are typically not related by blood. Each of these groups asserts authority over a specific territory, often a town, village, or neighborhood within a larger city. However, they don't fully establish and legitimize a monopoly on violence. Historically, the power structures of individual families served as the primary governing bodies within the two associations, persisting as the true centers of influence even after overarching entities like the Sicilian Mafia Commission were established in Cosa Nostra from the late 1950s onward. Clan Hierarchy in 1984, Tommaso Buscetta, a mafia informant, elucidated to prosecutors the hierarchical organization of a standard clan. At the helm of a clan is a boss, capa famiglia or representant, assisted by an underboss, capo bastone or sotto capo, and overseen by one or more advisors, consigliere. Below the boss's authority are units, decina, comprising approximately 10 soldiers, soldati, operai, or picciotti. Leading each decina is a capo decina. The structure of a given clan can vary, and despite the name decina, it doesn't necessarily imply having 10 soldiers. The number can range from 5 to 30. Some clans are so small that they lack decinas and capodecinas altogether. Even in larger clans, certain soldiers may directly report to the boss or underboss. The election of a clan's boss typically involves the participation of rank-and-file soldiers, although violent successions are not uncommon. Due to the modest size of most Sicilian clans, the boss maintains close contact with all members and doesn't enjoy many privileges or rewards compared to leaders in larger organizations, like the Five Families of New York. The boss's tenure is often brief, with yearly elections, and he may face deposition sooner if there's misconduct or incompetence. The second-in-command in a mafia family known as the underboss typically assumes a crucial role often being a family member, like a son. This individual steps in to lead the family in the event of the boss falling ill, being killed, or getting imprisoned. Additionally, the clan's consigliere, or counselor, is elected yearly. 
Among the conciliere's responsibilities is overseeing the boss and immediate subordinates, particularly in financial matters, to prevent embezzlement. Serving as an impartial advisor and mediator in internal disputes, the conciliere must maintain impartiality, devoid of any conflicts of interest or personal ambition. Apart from official members, Cosa Nostra extensively employs associates, individuals supporting or working for a clan without attaining full membership status. These associates, including corrupt officials and aspiring mafiosi, are viewed as tools by the mafiosi, serving a utilitarian purpose. Media often alludes to a boss of bosses or capo di tutti capi overseeing all of Cosa Nostra. Figures like C. Alogero Vizzini, Salvatore Riina, and Bernardo Provenzano have been portrayed as influential bosses, each dubbed the boss of bosses during their times. Nevertheless, former Mafia members like Buscetta maintain that the formal position does not exist, and according to Mafia historian Salvatore Lupo, media emphasis on the term capo di tutti capi lacks a solid foundation. Membership. Membership in Cosa Nostra is restricted solely to Sicilian men. Prospective candidates are ineligible if they are relatives of or have close affiliations with law enforcement officials such as police officers or judges. Although there is no strict age limit, individuals as young as 16 have undergone initiation into the organization. Aspiring mafiosi undergo thorough assessments for qualities such as obedience, discretion, courage, ruthlessness, and proficiency in espionage. Initiation into the Mafia typically involves the requirement to commit murder as the ultimate trial, regardless of whether the individual intends to pursue a career as an assassin. This act of murder serves dual purposes. It validates the individual's sincerity, ensuring they are not an undercover agent, and binds them into silence, preventing them from breaking omerta without facing murder charges themselves. For many street criminals, being part of the Mafia holds significant allure. Mafiosi commands widespread respect, as it is widely understood that offending a member risks severe and potentially lethal retaliation from the individual or their associates. Enjoying a certain degree of impunity, Mafiosi find it easier to evade justice, negotiate deals, and assert their privileges. Full members also gain increased freedom to engage in various criminal activities controlled by the Mafia, particularly in areas like protection racketeering. Traditionally, only males were eligible to become members of the Mafia, although there have been recent instances of women taking on the responsibilities of incarcerated Mafia relatives. Clans within the Mafia, also referred to as families, typically consist of individuals who are not biologically related. Most newly appointed bosses are unrelated to their predecessors, and the Commission prohibits relatives from concurrently holding positions in inter-clan bodies. Despite these rules, it is common for mafiosi to involve their sons in the criminal enterprise. The son's entry is facilitated by the approval and familiarity with Cosa Nostra traditions and requirements passed down from the father. A mafioso's legitimate profession, if one exists, usually does not impact their standing within Cosa Nostra. Throughout history, many mafiosi held menial jobs, and some bosses were entirely unemployed. While professionals like lawyers and doctors can be found within the organization, their roles are determined by the valuable skills they bring to the mafia. Commission. Since the 1950s, the Mafia has upheld various commissions aimed at settling disputes and fostering collaboration among clans. In Sicily, each province has its own commission, and clans are grouped into districts, mandamenti, comprising three or four geographically adjacent clans. A representative, capo mandamento, from each district is elected to participate in the provincial commission. Contrary to common perception, these commissions do not function as a centralized government for the Mafia. Their authority is restricted, and individual clans operate with autonomy and independence. Instead, 
Each commission acts as a representative mechanism for facilitating consultations among independent clans who make decisions through consensus. Criminologist Letizia Paoli emphasizes that these coordinating bodies should not be likened to executive boards of major legal firms, as their power is intentionally limited. Paoli asserts, it would be entirely wrong to perceive the Cosa Nostra as a centrally managed, internationally active mafia holding company, countering the portrayal often presented by the media. One of the primary roles of the Commission is to oversee and regulate the use of violence. For instance, if a member of the Mafia wishes to carry out a murder within another clan's territory, they are required to seek approval from the local boss, a rule enforced by the Commission. Approval from the Commission is also necessary for any murder involving a Mafia member or a prominent figure such as police, lawyers, politicians, journalists, etc. This process helps prevent potential conflicts with other clans and mitigates the risk of sparking a war as the Commission serves as a mechanism for obtaining approval. Additionally, the Commission addresses issues related to succession within the Mafia. When a boss passes away or decides to retire, the reputation of their clan often diminishes, leading clients to abandon the clan and seek protection from neighboring clans. This shift in alliances can significantly elevate the status and power of rival clans, potentially causing regional instability and the onset of conflicts. In response, the Commission may opt to redistribute the territory and members of the deceased or retired boss's clan among neighboring clans. Alternatively, the Commission holds the authority to appoint a region to oversee the clan until a new boss is elected. Rituals and Codes of Conduct initiation ceremony. Bernardino Vero, a prominent figure in the Fasci Siciliani, a socio-political movement that emerged in Sicily during the early 1890s, provided one of the initial accounts of a mafia initiation ceremony. Seeking both strength for the movement and personal protection, Vero joined the Corleone-based mafia group known as the Fratuzzi, Little Brothers. Recalling the events in a memoir penned years later, he recounted his initiation experience in the spring of 1893. Invited to participate in a clandestine gathering of the Fratuzzi, I entered a mysterious room where numerous armed men sat around a table. At the table's center lay a paper with a drawn skull and a knife. To gain entry into the Fratuzzi, I underwent an initiation involving trials of loyalty and the pricking of my lower lip with the knife's tip, allowing the blood to saturate the depicted skull. Bernardino Vero Following his apprehension, mobster Giovanni Brusca recounted the ritual during which he officially became a full-fledged member of Cosa Nostra. In 1976, he received an invitation to a feast at a rural estate. Entering a room, he found several mafiosi seated around a table adorned with a pistol, a dagger, and a sheet featuring an image of a saint. Interrogating his commitment to criminality and murder, despite his prior history of such actions, they sought affirmation. Upon Brusca's confirmation, Salvatore Riina, then the dominant boss of Cosa Nostra, used a needle to prick Brusca's finger. Brusca then applied his blood to the saint's image, holding it as Riina set it ablaze. While juggling the burning image, Riina warned Brusca, stating, If you betray Cosa Nostra, your flesh will burn like this saint. The components of this ceremony have undergone minimal change throughout the Mafia's history. Sociologist Diego Gambetta observes that due to the secretive nature of the criminal organization, they cannot risk having recruits sign written contracts or application forms that might be seized by law enforcement. Therefore, they adhere to the traditional ritual ceremony. The deliberate specificity, peculiarity and pain incorporated into the elements ensure a memorable and unequivocal event witnessed by senior mafiosi. The participants may not necessarily comprehend the symbolic meanings, and these symbols may lack intrinsic significance.
the true purpose of the ritual is to eliminate any doubt about the mafioso's newfound status, preventing its denial or revocation on a whim. Introductions There is a constant concern that individuals from outside or undercover law enforcement may pose as members of the Mafia to infiltrate the organization. To prevent such infiltration, a member of the Mafia should not disclose their identity to another member whom they do not personally know, even if they are aware of the individual's reputation. If a relationship needs to be established, the Mafia member must approach a third party whom they both personally know, asking them to facilitate an introduction in a face-to-face -face meeting. This intermediary serves as a guarantee that neither party is an imposter. This adherence to tradition is maintained meticulously, even at the expense of operational efficiency. For example, when Mafia member Indelicato Amadeo returned to Sicily after being initiated in the United States during the 1950s, he couldn't inform his own Mafia-affiliated father about his membership directly. Instead, he had to wait for a fellow Mafia member from the United States, who was aware of his initiation, to come to Sicily and introduce him to his father. Etiquette Mafiosi of equivalent rank occasionally refer to each other as compare, signifying comrade, whereas subordinates address their superiors as padrino, the Italian term for godfather. Ten Commandments In November 2007, Sicilian authorities revealed the discovery of a set of Ten Commandments in the hideout of Mafia boss Salvatore Lo Piccolo, these guidelines were believed to outline principles for honorable and respectful conduct for members of the Mafia. Direct interactions between our associates are prohibited. A third party must facilitate introductions, avoid any inappropriate attention towards the spouses of fellow members, maintain distance from law enforcement personnel, abstain from frequenting pubs and clubs, being readily available for Cosa Nostra, is a fundamental obligation, even in situations like imminent childbirth for one's spouse. Strict adherence to scheduled appointments is imperative, considering rank and authority. Treat the wives of fellow members with utmost respect. When providing information, always convey the truth. Do not misappropriate money that rightfully belongs to others or other families. Individuals ineligible for Cosa Nostra membership include those with close relatives in law enforcement, those with untrustworthy family members within the organization, and those displaying immoral behavior or a disregard for ethical values. Antonino Calderon detailed equivalent commandments during his testimony in 1987. Refrain from engaging with the wives of fellow men of honor. Prohibit theft from other men of honor or anyone in general. Avoid involvement in prostitution activities. Only resort to killing other men of honor when absolutely essential. Steer clear of sharing information with law enforcement. Abstain from disputes with fellow men of honor. Uphold proper conduct at all times. Maintain silence regarding Cosa Nostra when in the presence of outsiders. Strictly avoid initiating contact with other men of honor under any circumstances. Omerta. Omerta is a code of silence and confidentiality that prohibits members of the Mafia from revealing information about their associates to law enforcement. Violating this code carries a severe consequence, death, and the family members of the betrayer may also face the same fate. Typically, members of the Mafia avoid any association with the police, except in cases where they may corrupt individual officers as needed. For instance, if a member of the Mafia becomes a victim of a crime, he is unlikely to involve the police and is expected to handle the situation independently. Doing otherwise would jeopardize his reputation as a reliable protector, potentially exposing him to perceptions of weakness and vulnerability by enemies. The necessity for secrecy and discretion profoundly influences the customs and behaviors of Mafia members. They are advised against consuming alcohol or drugs, as intoxication may lead to inadvertent disclosure of sensitive information. Additionally, 
They often adopt modest attitudes when interacting with strangers to avoid drawing unwanted attention. Unlike the typically verbose and expressive nature of many Sicilians, Mafia members tend to be more concise and reserved. Another notable prohibition is the act of documenting their activities, as written evidence could be discovered by law enforcement. Mafia members also extend the principle of omerta to the general populace to some extent. Civilians who enter into agreements, such as purchasing protection, are expected to maintain discretion, facing the risk of death if they fail to do so. Witness intimidation is a common tactic employed by the Mafia as well. Protection rackets. Scholars like Diego Gambetta and Leopold Franchetti have defined the Mafia as a consortium of private protection entities. The primary role of the Mafia revolves around offering protection and ensuring trust in sectors of the Sicilian economy where reliance on the police and legal system is precarious. The Mafia intervenes in settling disputes among criminals, coordinates and supervises illegal business transactions and safeguards entrepreneurs and lawbreakers from fraud, theft and vandalism. This facet of the Mafia often goes unnoticed in the media due to its discreet nature, as it is not typically reported to law enforcement. In one of his works, Gambetta illustrates this idea through a scenario involving a butcher seeking to sell meat to a supermarket without paying sales tax. Given the essentially underground nature of the transaction, neither party can resort to the police or the legal system in case of deceit. The seller might provide spoiled meat, or the buyer might refuse payment. The mutual distrust and the apprehension of being deceived without any recourse could hinder a profitable transaction. To ensure the honesty of both parties, they may enlist the local Mafia clan to oversee the deal. In return for a fee, the Mafiosi assures both the buyer and seller that any attempt at deception will result in physical assault or property damage. The Mafioso's reputation for brutality, impartiality and reliability dissuades both parties from contemplating deceit while he oversees the transaction, allowing the deal to proceed smoothly. The Mafia's safeguarding services extend beyond illegal endeavors. Shopkeepers often remit payments to the Mafia for protection against thieves. Upon entering a protection agreement with a Mafioso, the latter publicly declares that any would-be thief attempting to rob the client's store will face repercussions. The Mafioso pledges to track down the thief, administer a beating, and if possible, recover the stolen goods leveraging their knowledge of local fences. Contrary to a common misconception, the Mafia's dealings go beyond coercive tactics and encompass actual protection services. Although the Mafia may employ coercion to secure clients, many actively seek their protection, especially those involved in criminal activities. This dynamic has contributed to the Mafia's resilience against government attempts to dismantle it, as those benefiting from its protection actively shield it from law enforcement. Individuals enjoying Mafia protection are disinclined to have the police intervene against their Mafioso. In Sicily, protection money is termed Pizzo, a term reflected in the name of the anti-extortion support group Adio Pizzo. Mafiosi occasionally request favors instead of monetary payments, such as assistance in committing a crime. The amount of money extorted by the Mafia from businesses in Sicily exhibits a weak correlation with the firm's revenue. Consequently, smaller businesses bear a higher proportion of their profits to the Mafia compared to larger enterprises. Smaller firms may surrender up to 40% of their profits, while larger ones may contribute as little as 2%. This form of extortion, known as pizzo, operates as a regressive tax, disproportionately affecting small businesses. This economic barrier impedes entrepreneurial entry in Sicily, making it challenging for small businesses to reinvest in themselves. The result is oligopolistic markets dominated by a few large firms selling low-quality products at inflated prices. The cycle of mafia extortion 
thus entrenches the Sicilian economy in a poverty trap. Protection from theft. The Mafia offers a safeguard against theft as one of its services to paying clients. Members of the Mafia typically refrain from engaging in theft themselves, although in practice, the prohibition is mainly directed at stealing from individuals associated with the Mafia. Instead, they focus on familiarizing themselves with all the thieves and fences operating in their designated territory. In the event of a robbery at a protected business, the clan leverages these connections to locate and recover the stolen items, subsequently punishing the thieves, often through physical confrontation. This pursuit frequently extends into the territories of other clans, leading to collaborative efforts among clans as they share information and impede the sale of the stolen goods whenever possible. Protection from competition. Mafiosi often shield business persons from competitors by intimidating rivals with the threat of violence. For instance, if two entrepreneurs vie for a government contract, the protected individual can enlist the assistance of their Mafia associates to coerce their competitor out of the bidding process. Another scenario involves a Mafioso acting on behalf of a coffee supplier, pressuring local bars to exclusively serve their clients' coffee. However, the predominant method through which the Mafia quashes competition involves overseeing and enforcing collusive agreements among business people. Mafia-backed collusion typically manifests in markets where collusion is both advantageous due to inelastic demand, lack of product differentiation, etc., and challenging to establish numerous competitors, low barriers to entry. Industries fitting this description include garbage collection, client relations. Mafia members approach potential clients with a combination of aggressiveness and friendliness, reminiscent of door-to-door -door salesmanship. They may sweeten the deal by offering complimentary favors. If a client declines their offers, the Mafia might resort to coercive tactics, such as damaging property or engaging in other forms of harassment. While physical assault is uncommon, Severe consequences like murder may befall clients who violate agreements or collaborate with law enforcement, though mere refusal of protection typically does not lead to such extreme measures. In many cases, Mafia leaders prefer cultivating enduring, open-ended relationships with clients rather than entering into one-time contracts. By publicly declaring a client to be under permanent protection, referred to as a friend in Sicilian terms, the boss minimizes confusion about who is safeguarded. This clarity discourages potential threats from targeting protected clients, leaving the unprotected vulnerable to criminal activities. Mafiosi generally refrain from meddling in the day-to-day -day management of the businesses they safeguard or mediate. Their reasons often include a lack of expertise and a desire to avoid conflicting interests that could compromise their roles as protectors and arbitrators. This approach fosters trust among clients, as they can be confident that the Mafia won't seize control of their enterprises. Protection Territories A Mafia syndicate cannot tolerate the presence of rival racketeers encroaching on their territory, in the event of a conflict between two clients safeguarded by opposing racketeers, a confrontation ensues as the racketeers vie for supremacy in resolving the dispute on behalf of their respective clients. The outcomes of such clashes are both unpredictable and gruesome, with no assurance of victory for either racketeer. Consequently, their protection becomes unreliable, diminishing in value. Clients may opt for alternative methods to settle disputes, jeopardizing the reputation of the racketeers. To avert this, Mafia clans engage in negotiations to delineate territories where they can exclusively exert influence in resolving conflicts through violence. This territorial negotiation is not always peaceful and often serves as the underlying cause of many Mafia conflicts. As Mafia clans offer protection within these territorial monopolies, the cost of their services tends to be high, accompanied by a frequently subpar quality. Other activities. Vote buying. 
politicians seek the support of mafia figures to secure votes during elections. The mere backing of a specific candidate by a mafioso can sway their clients, relatives and associates to vote for that candidate. An influential mafioso holds the power to bring in thousands of votes, reflecting the significant influence they command. With the Italian parliament boasting a substantial number of seats in its 630-member Chamber of Deputies and 315-plus member Senate, and with numerous political parties vying for them, winning candidates may only need a few thousand votes. Therefore, the endorsement of a Mafia clan can play a pivotal role in determining electoral success. Politicians have consistently approached us, recognizing our ability to deliver votes. Within our circle of friends and family, every person of integrity has the capacity to rally around 40 to 50 additional individuals. In the Palermo province alone, there are approximately 1,500 to 2,000 individuals of honor. If we amplify this by 50, it translates into a significant block of 75,000 to 100,000 votes that can be directed towards supportive parties and candidates. Antonino Calderon. Politicians commonly reciprocate this backing through various means, including obstructing law enforcement inquiries or awarding contracts and permits. While not inherently driven by ideology, members of the Mafia have typically resisted extremist political parties like fascists and communists, showing a preference for centrist candidates. Smuggling. Mafia members offer protection and invest funds in illicit smuggling networks. Operating smuggling ventures demands significant financial backing for goods, boats, crews, etc. But few individuals are willing to entrust their money to criminal organizations. Mafiosi takes on the role of raising the required capital from investors and ensuring the trustworthiness of all involved parties. Additionally, they guarantee the safety of the smuggling operations. Mafia members seldom directly engage in smuggling activities, typically only doing so when the operations are exceptionally risky. In such instances, they may incorporate smugglers into their clans to establish stronger ties. This was notably evident in heroin smuggling, where the scale of volumes and profits necessitated a more direct involvement in the operations. Bid rigging. The Italian Sicilian Mafia is thought to generate a revenue of 6.5 billion euros by influencing both public and private contracts. Employing tactics such as threats of violence and vandalism, members of the Mafia eliminate competitors and secure contracts for the companies under their influence. While they typically don't directly oversee the managed businesses, they profit by taking a percentage of their earnings, often through payments known as pizzo. Loan Sharking Approximately 25.2% of businesses in Sicily had financial obligations to loan sharks, resulting in an annual payment collection of around 1.4 billion euros. This percentage increased during the late 2000 AS recession, with the tightening of bank lending pushing those in desperate financial situations to resort to borrowing from the Mafia. Forbidden Crimes Certain categories of criminal activities are prohibited by the Cosa Nostra, whether perpetrated by its members or independent criminals operating within their territories. Mafiosi are typically prohibited from engaging in theft, including burglary and mugging. Kidnapping is also generally forbidden, even for non-mafiosi, due to the substantial public animosity and increased police scrutiny it attracts. These regulations have been breached on occasion, both with and without the consent of higher-ranking mafiosi, violence and reputation, murder. Killings are typically executed by insiders within the Mafia. It is highly uncommon for the Mafia to enlist an outsider for a singular task, and those individuals are often at risk of elimination shortly thereafter, as they are deemed disposable liabilities. The primary targets of Mafia violence are usually rival Mafia families vying for control of territory and business opportunities.
The prevalence of violence is higher in the Sicilian Mafia compared to the American Mafia due to the smaller and more numerous Mafia families in Sicily, contributing to a more unstable environment. Reputation The strength of the Mafia lies in its ability to instill fear through a notorious reputation for committing acts of violence, particularly murder, against virtually anyone. Through this reputation, Members of the Mafia can deter both their adversaries and those who pose a threat to their clients. This enables them to provide protection without the need for a physical presence, such as serving as bodyguards or watchmen, allowing them to safeguard multiple clients simultaneously. In the realm of occupations, a mafioso places extraordinary value on reputation as their primary service revolves around offering protection through intimidation. A mafioso's reputation is characterized by a clear dichotomy. They are either deemed an effective protector or an inadequate one, with no room for mediocrity. The reason for this lies in the binary outcome a mafioso faces, either successfully preventing an act of violence or failing utterly if violence occurs. There is no middle ground in the quality of violent protection. Consequently, a series of failures has the potential to completely tarnish a mafioso's reputation, jeopardizing their entire enterprise. The more formidable a mobster's notoriety becomes, the greater his ability to resolve disputes without resorting to violence. It is even plausible that a mobster, stripped of the means for physical aggression, such as having all his associates in prison, can still leverage his reputation to intimidate and offer protection, provided others remain unaware of his vulnerability and continue to believe in his influence. However, these deceptive tactics typically prove short-lived, as rivals may sense the weakness and challenge him. Upon a Mafia boss retiring from leadership or meeting demise, the clan's reputation as effective guardians and enforcers often departs with him. If the successor lacks a robust reputation, clients may lose faith in the clan and defect to neighboring groups, leading to a shift in power dynamics and potential conflicts. Ideally, the new leader should have cultivated a strong reputation while ascending the ranks, ensuring the clan gains a respected and reputable successor. Consequently, established Mafia clans hold a significant advantage over newcomers who start from scratch, as joining a clan as a soldier provides an aspiring mobster with an opportunity to build his own reputation under the guidance and safeguard of experienced mafiosi.